Don't Wait for the Movie, Emergency Broadcast, Freedom, Powerhouse, Tales of Wonder, Highlands, more and more. If you're into Christian music at all, you remember the 80s and 90s, you remember Whiteheart. Unbelievable, unmatched, and the blazing vocals of Rick Florian today on the CCM Legacy Cast, which starts in 5, 4... <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the CCM Legacy Cast. I'm your host, Chris Gaines, and my co-host, as always, Scott Galden. What is up, brother? What is up is the Cowboys are going to the Super Bowl. You heard me say okay, it. We're, well, we're close, okay? Four more are, games, we'll be there, okay? <laughs> or three more games, we'll be there. <laughs> you are like Lucy, and you keep te- teeing the ball up for me, and then I come running at it, and you just yank it away from me every time. Every time. I'm, t- I'm getting prepared for my heart to be broken. Just getting ready for it. So yeah, that anybody that knows me knows that I'm a big Cowboy fan. So we'll see what so, it is. And knows uh, you as well. So you're a big you Cowboy know, fan. I, I'm in therapy for that. I'm in therapy for that. <laughs> I was at the last time we were in the Super Bowl back in the day. Oh, wow. I was, that I was, was at Super Bowl 30. Yeah, it was <laughs> Super Bowl 30 <laughs> the last time we were there. We, this, is not, this is not Cowboys talk. This is like, no. <laughs> we are CCM Legacy Cast and uh, Rick Florian. Who is an Indiana boy? Yep. What is one of the greatest products out of Indiana, in your opinion? Go. Great. Besides wow. Rick. Jeez. Yeah. I'm going to say Hoosiers, but that doesn't really count. Uh, because... The Indianapolis or the, the the Indianapolis 500. Yeah. Got to go there one time. What a great sporting event! If you if you've never gone, it is a spectacle. It's a whole lot more than a race. It, it's a spectacle. You just yeah. go round and round and round and round. Uh, yeah, but there's a big party before and after that makes makes it worth watching. Okay. All right. well, Huge maybe... party. Let me bring Rick on. Surely he's got something better to offer than uh, than just that. I Rick, definitely have something better to offer because all you've said so far is talking about the horrid cowboys. <laughs> well, yeah. thanks for thanks for joining us, Rick. We'll catch you guys. Yeah, another yeah. Time. <laughs> good to be with you. See ya. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, thought sorry. we could thought we could be friends, but maybe not. So, so what, are you, what are you throwing out there? The no, Titans, it's the all owners, your owners fault. I loved Landry when he was there. Yes. And Wade got rid of Landry, just seems so dismissive. Back, most kids don't even go, who's Landry? It, it is, uh, yeah, it's just, because I'm <laughs> I'm a Hoosier. It's like where I'm from in South Bend was the Bears, because I'm an hour, hour and a half from Chicago. Sure. And then, oh, oh we got an Indiana team. The Colts came, so I love the Colts. And then I moved to, in December of 84, I've been here 40 years now. I moved to, to Nashville, and they eventually got the Titans. Yeah. And Lisa, my awesome wife, she is from Cincinnati, and she is a Bengals freak. And so now I've involved in a way that's kind of a lot of conflagration of – we were talking the other day of, like, who are the teams we hate the most in, mm-hmm. in football? And I'm afraid that so – Were you a, were you a Colts guy growing up? Well, when I was growing up, their Colts were in Baltimore. Right, yeah. That's but how I, old I, I am. I, that's true. Good, good, <laughs> good, oh, good point. Therefore, <laughs> no, it was only that I okay. told, oh, my gosh, that's great. We got a team. And so I did follow the Colts well, and Peyton was there a long time, who was a UT guy down here. Yes, and yes. so just through the years, that has been one of the things that has taken up my time as music has gone to the wayside for me on purpose that I I love football, college football. I'm Notre mm. Dame fan, was born one mile from campus. My wife hates it when I say that, but I just, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> I am who I am. And uh, <laughs> yeah, love Notre Dame. That, you know, oh, yeah. I don't want to get caught talking so in football, but one, you started one of, our bu- one of our bucket list items is to, to get to a game in South Bend. Do you recommend it? Oh, it, it, there are events really that are beyond the sport itself. And it is they they added on to the coliseum but they did it so tastefully that it feels like it could all still be 80 years old and the campus itself is old it feels um the buildings and the structures for the most part and touchdown jesus and all of those elements it it is we went to a game this year oh it's so sad we took my 89-year-old dad and a bunch of us family went up to the Ohio State game. 
Okay. And we lost on the last play of the game virtually. Whereas if we can hold them from that one yard from the goal, we win. And if we don't, we lose and we lost. Oh. But it was great being with dad and we hung out at a B and B with family and stuff before and after. It was wonderful. What a great That's memory. Cool. What a great memory. I, that, I mentioned that Super Bowl. That was my last best trip with my dad. He and I got on a plane together. He never Never got on a plane after that day, and we spent the whole week in Tempe, Arizona, which was a blast. Oh, that's and, great. You know, we, and we won the game, and then we stayed after oh. <laughs> to, to get a cheap air fl- airfare. We stayed after, and so there's nothing like a Super Bowl city after the Super Bowl. It's like a ghost town, and you pick up all these great, <laughs> great deals. And we were just hang- <laughs> we were just watching, walking, and we met a lot of really cool people, uh, even Steeler fans, because I'd grown up Steelers. You hate the Steelers. There was yeah. some really neat Mid America, Salt of oh, the Earth yeah. people, and the game's over, and so everybody's kind of cool. Anyway. Yeah. We'll have we'll have football talk later. Please join the three of us <laughs> weekly. As I mean, go ahead and get your bets in. We're we're sponsored. I, certainly, by- I, I think we found a topic we have passion for. I think that's that's an well, easy easy game. Let me say this: when we before we our pre we have a pre production show. This is big time. This is big time production. We have pre production. We were talking, and and Rick starts singing Chicago, and I thought I was gonna have to reel Scott back in because oh my god, the two of them were just going yeah. having a love fest about Chicago, and so we may <laughs> we may have Chicago talk as well not the city or the bears but the yeah. band yeah okay? May, yeah. maybe one of the most underappreciated bands of all time would be my you just my go comment. through the rolodex of songs that they yes. that they had that were radio enormous radio songs and the arrangements of where they went musically mm-hmm. in those and the, the horns yes. especially were just phenomenal they were just great I, I, I've gone to several concerts and I, I've told people it's amazing that you can see a, a band play for an hour and a half and still not play three quarters of their songbook. It's like th- their hits, you, you're, you're, yeah. you walk out going, well, they didn't play this. They didn't play this. They didn't play this. They played all everything they played. You enjoyed, but there were mm-hmm. so many that they didn't get to because their songbook is just so big. It's just mm-hmm. massive. Yeah. Well, on that well, note, let's segue into a story that's probably bigger than one recording. We may have to do multiple. But, Scott, if you wouldn't mind getting us kicked off, so let's dive into Rick's life and, and really uh, maybe do it a little differently. I think he's been interviewed a bunch. Yeah. Uh, mainly because he's getting old. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I've been looking forward to this a lot. They were right in my wheelhouse, especially my, my absolute, my wife's absolute favorite Christian man. She was into Loverboy oh. and all that stuff back in the 80s. Oh. And, we, and when she found Whiteheart, she was like, <gasps> Oh my gosh. And so, I mean, she burned through, I'm not saying we're old, but she burned through about five or six cassettes of Whiteheart. Bro- broke our little AC Delco with the cassettes with the, with the tape coming out. But to that end, Scott, let me hand the baton to you. Yeah. And we'll get started. Well, what, what, I think what a fascinating story, Rick. You, you're bored a mile from uh, Notre South, Dame. Baby. Notre Dame. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's go back there. What? <laughs> So tell us about growing up. What was it like? What was it like in your family growing up? South Bend, Indiana kisses right up to the Michigan border. It's right in the center. What is that? Longitudinally in the middle of Indiana, but at the very top. And we, when I was one, we moved out of town. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to get outside of town. So we rented this old farmhouse. I had a couple barns that the old farmer still used the the bill farmer guy i just now remember that he called my sister and i ketchup and mustard i don't remember <laughs> why and I, just thought, I still think of that finally he was soft-spoken old fella and jumping out of the hayloft down into more hay just messing around being outside those those old stories you hear of like open the door send the kids outside and then lock the door just go out there and play and the world is your playground go for yeah, it right exactly I mean, uh, while we did have indoor plumbing, there was a two-hole outhouse. Thank you. Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> and uh, that it had, and for the days before it had plumbing. So it was, we lived there till I was, that was on Tamarack Road. And then we moved about two miles away to a house on 10 acres my folks bought. And we lived there, and they lived there till... Golly, I can't remember. They moved to Indianapolis sometime around 90, maybe. I can't okay. remember. Late 80s, something like that. And, but yeah, I lived, we, it was just a little mini farm. We had sheep and a couple horses and 
mm-hmm. bunch of chickens, geese for a while. I don't remember uh, an angora. Just just animals to mess around with. And then had right. like a half acre to acre garden that yeah. was really large. Best tomatoes to this day in my life. And I'm it's not just nostalgic. It's the soil up in Indiana is yeah. so much different than where I live now, south of Nashville and Franklin. It is it's amazing how soil makes a difference with um, vegetation in general. But sure. Was it just you and your sister growing up? Was it? No, my brother. My brother okay. was the oldest. And okay. uh, so we all were just outside messing, hanging around. We'd make a fort in a tree, which what that meant is you took a two by six and nails in a hammer and found some kind of combination of limbs where you could nail it on there and just set. It was flat that. at that point. <laughs> we weren't building really, really houses. We like to think that was our house. But I remember that one on the, uh, oh, that was a sassafras tree that was on my dad's rock wall that he built through the years. Um, gathering old farmers, when you're plowing a field, they'll catch a rock every once in a while. The rocks up there, which are very different than the rocks we have down here, they're like round river rock sort of things. And over time, my dad built a, a rock wall that he masoned in that was probably, I don't know, several hundred feet long. And it, just all those things that that part is very sweet and nostalgic for me, where some of the animals were buried right there and wow. through the years and the porch swing out at the barn. Just what is that stereotypical kind of growing up? Yeah, what what kind of things was your family active in? What, I, I would assume probably well, active in church and yes, school and yeah. all that kind of. We're Gersh, Mark Gershman, one of the, the keyboard player, one of the primary writers in the band. He used a phrase once when he would talk most of the time that, in some ways, fit me too. Where he said, "Curiously dreamless." When you're out there, you just are doing life out there, and we weren't. Yeah, we watched television some, never listened to the radio hardly ever. And the only music that was in our lives was the little country church you go to and you sing hymns. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Thompson and the ladies on one side turned at a 90 degree angle to the congregation, the guys on the other side. And so my dad, my brother and I over there, my mom and sister on the other side at the old United Methodist Church. And that just made me think Hal Muncie superintendent of schools, he sang with the guys over there and he just passed away. He was 90 something uh, just about a week ago. Uh, A buddy, my best friend from high school, we were bouncing back and forth about that, saw it online. But just think about, it, it it was simple, not complicated. There wasn't, the, the only music was that. There was okay. no, like, I didn't know what the Beatles were. I wow. didn't know any of that. I didn't know music was going on because my folks didn't. And the there was no interaction with the greater culture when you're out in Nowheresville, Indiana, anything that was going on. I had no idea about Chicago. Wow. So, what, it, when did you realize that you had a talent in music? Were, were, did you did, were, did you find that you were talented growing oh, up with it? And I don't even I don't think of it that way as like and people obviously have asked that question on on in different ways many times of when did you know you could sing? It's like yes. well, you know, I I didn't know that I really sang well until probably sometime in junior high. And so I go to a boonies school and stuff like that. And so they had South Bend had a Northern Indiana boys choir they were putting together. And this was probably about seventh grade, I think. And they had tryouts. So I got to be in the South Bend boys choir is really the Northern Indiana one, but whatever. And so we sang with the South Bend Symphony Orchestra once when I was like, dang, this is like crazy wild. But I'm not (laughs) thinking because I don't have any context of popular music. Right. I just I sang with the South Bend (laughs) Symphony with these dudes. And okay, that was cool. Okay. But I didn't think now I'm going to go do X, Y, Z because I didn't know about X, Y, Z out there musically. Didn't even know existed. Wow. No. And and so. Oh, because even in high school, when they asked me to sing the choir, I was in choir in high school, 
And then they had this thing they called swing choir, which Ooh. that me meant you danced a little. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so sad when I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, there's, uh, there's probably a picture somewhere in like, if you do that classmates thing online or whatever, probably some. There's a yearbook the photo season. somewhere. There's a yeah, yearbook yeah, photo floating around. At the end of the season. Annual. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I like that because then you might have got to hold the hand of a girl or something while you were singing. Sure. Yeah. Well, we sang, I don't remember which one it was, like a Beatles song, that that was the first time I heard a Beatles song. But we ruined it because we were doing this like contemporary thing and some lady playing the piano while we we're doing it. Hmm. And uh, so it, it really wasn't until at David Fenstermacher's house in Walkerton, Indiana, which is where our John Glenn High School, where I went to high school, mm -hmm that he put on a Dan Fogelberg Netherlands album. And to this day, probably because it was like the beginning, that was for me like intersection of beauty in art that is just, to this day, I love to death that album. His ability to wire music and lyrics together that made sense together that felt like the lyrics and mind you my wife would probably roll her eyes a bit because i'm not known for listening to lyrics very well <laughs> i am drawn to, i'm drawn to the melody the all those things that the music is doing that's that's what would always pull me in it wasn't because of a lyric literally never frankly really? it, it was what did it make me feel? You mentioned like Lover Boy. Once, once I got the next album, he pulled off his record player and then he put on Larry Norman only visiting this planet. Now, most uh, people who listen to CCM stuff, Christian music, whatever you want to call it, music that talks about their relationship with God or Jesus, the when he played that, it was like, uh, it was totally obviously different than what Fogelberg was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, the the soft beauty of that Fogelberg album, and then you put on this guy that is like a 60s hippie who found Jesus or Jesus found him, and it was, what is this? And <laughs> it makes me laugh every time, and I have said this on other podcasts too, because through the years of being in White Hart, the finding out that the radio is filtered, and some of it appropriately so, mm -hmm. but when he had lyrics that said, sipping whiskey from a paper cup, drown your sorrows till you can't stand up, I never heard that. Uh, and again, I never knew CCM stuff existed at this point. I was like, like that was even for me then. A sheltered kid was like, what the heck? Gonorrhea on Valentine's Day? Right. Always right. looking for the perfect lay. Right. I didn't even know what lay meant then. Yeah. It's like, yeah. why don't you look into Jesus? He's got the answer. Right yeah. after he said those other words, he said, why don't you look into Jesus? He's got the answer. Back in 70 whatever, Mm -hmm. There wasn't CCM didn't exist. And but there were some. It was the beginning of CCM becoming a thing. And so the honesty of what he was talking about is like the whole sexual revolution and the drug evolution mm -hmm. in the 60s it came somehow out of the 50s, too. But. It was, and then evolving, therefore, into the 70s, it were these guys like Keggy or whatever that came out of mainstream music mm -hmm. and God drew them to himself and they became uh, a follower of Jesus. And in that, how do I, they're trying to piece that combination together, the music that they knew and loved, and then this new relationship that's changed their life. And they're like, it, it was a work, I think, for them on some level. But that's why they never saw some of the people that in the late 70s and especially early 80s 
would go, that's the devil's music and all that kind of thing. It was, well, all that just comes from fear and on yeah, some level. Absolutely. <laughs> and yeah. see some of the stuff that came from that culture. So they couldn't put the two together. Yeah. Well, let me go back to like high school. What, how would you describe your, the, the progress of your faith through high Next. school? What, what was that like? What, because I know a lot of people, it's when you start growing up and thinking of the larger things of life. Mm -hmm. of, and I was kind of a little bit afraid of like, man, what am I going to do after high school? When it was like a junior, senior year. Mm -hmm. And so back, I had, I went forward at a Billy Graham crusade at Notre Dame Stadium. Mm -hmm. And, but I kind of lived in a pretty dead church where um, the discipleship part, there was some there, there was some discipleship kind of sweet, wonderful, lovely people. And my buddy, Dave Fensenmark, I mentioned, his family went to United Methodist Church in Walkerton. We went to an old country church out in the boonies, like 10 minutes away, five, 10 minutes. And... So it was kind of fledgling, but it it wasn't very deep because I just didn't understand. There wasn't great encouragement of understanding God's word deeply and how vital it would be to our understanding and growth in that relationship. They would have said, sure, that's great. But there, there just wasn't the creation of a, a deep longing in it. And when I graduated, it wasn't. I got a, I, I started at Taylor, well, and finished at Taylor University, mm -hmm. about an hour and a half, two hours from my house in Nowheresville, Indiana. Upland, mm -hmm. Indiana has about 800 people. The school has 2,000, so it's kind of weird. Oh. One of these many Christian liberal arts schools that are out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, some of them are in big cities, but this sure. it's been around since, like, I think it was 1850. And... It was there that you start meeting this cross section of people who had at very young ages have a deep walk with Jesus and mm -hmm. encouragement in Bible study and mm -hmm. just a way broader opening of what it is to to know who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And and so were you that drawn was to that were you, were you drawn to that pretty deeply? Was oh, that yes. something was, that was I, that very felt, life changing and, and affirming for you? Yes, yes. And to this day, even like one of my buddies, Scott, he Scott Shaw, he he had he's been doing for decades this ministry to missionaries, Barnabas is it's called. And I read his newsletters all the time. But and I had, but I hardly ever communicate with him. But just felt prompted one couple weeks ago, just sent a note out because he showed grandbaby pictures, mm -hmm. and I just <laughs> welcomed him to that experience because I have four. And okay. Scott on our floor, he was just, he was already years in the Word more than I had ever been, and he would challenge me at times that in love about things that were like just lovely and wonderful. And, and to this day, Jay Case and our RA, Dave Smith, we're in, there's Fort Wayne in LA and Jay's a prof in oh, was it Malone in Ohio. And we'll maybe only twice a year, just do a, what we're doing now, a video call, say, what's up? And each of them, oh, they're lovely. Mm, just because they they don't have filters anymore you can talk about anything challenges and things like that and that is just lovely and i will also say speaking of what you started from in high school i was not raised to talk about stuff mm -hmm. it, it just like there was no like like even like the conversation about sex with your kids. Like my brother got a book, no conversation. I got nothing. Like I wasn't <laughs> sure by the time I graduated for sure how everything worked. I mean, it was that 
it was like, that was how sheltered I was. And it's just like, I'm sad about that, but it is what it is. Sure. And so I was pretty sheltered and immature about a lot of things. And even now I feel like I'm probably 16, but, <laughs> but I did get a biology degree. So I figured all that stuff out through that. Okay. <laughs> well, and I was going to go to that next. And I, I had heard somewhere that you had gone to college for a marine biology degree. Is that well, correct? I, or, yeah, or... in Taylor, at Taylor University, they don't have marine biology. So I got a biology degree. And, and frankly, I did biology mainly because I love being out in creation. And okay. I didn't know anything else that I would like. So okay. maybe I was going to do environmental science. Maybe it was going to be something like that. But I was intrigued by Jacques Cousteau's shows that they had back in the days in the 70s and 80s. Yes. And that was the, the drawing part for me. And you remember I said that thing about my next cup of coffee? Is this like, am I allowed to do this? this Let's, take awesome. Let's take a break. Let's take a break. I just went over there and I pushed the go button and, and we could keep going even if you want because I just pushed the go button. So um, anyway. Jacques well, Cousteau. We, I haven't we, thought about that in forever. I'm I know. So I was by, it was so his awesome. Son does, his son does stuff now. Yes. Uh, oh, no. Yeah, totally. In Ooh, fact, you God. remember I was I was also a Wild Kingdom guy. Oh, yes, was a, uh, that was yes. On Sunday, wasn't it? Oh no, yes, yeah, yeah, Sunday night. Yeah. So yeah. now we're gonna go back Sunday to night. football talk. But you knew <laughs> you you kind of worked in Perkins and and Wild Kingdom, and then of course when oh. sixty minutes came on, you were like, oh crud, I gotta go back to school. <laughs> <Dang it. laughs> the the anyway. adults took over again, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we didn't we didn't have you know we didn't have Nat Geo, we didn't have what they oh, you know, all the stuff. Yeah. So we would Nothing. just kind of be like, and Jacques Cousteau. We, I think he was 104 and he was going down in a submarine. We we're like, oh, I want to do that. That is so freaking cool. That is man. so awesome. Yes. So but that I, was really what intrigued me a lot. And just again, being out in creation and growing up that way, it was, it's very, and to this day, one of my favorite therapies, if you will, is sometime as a real estate agent, I've been like 28 years doing full-time real estate and <clears throat> When I have a client looking for maybe deer hunting property or just some land, going out in the late fall when mm -hmm. all of the brush is down, all the ticks are down, and it is just crunching the leaves, and you can see through the forest because all the leaves in the shrubbery have gone fallow. It is just, oh, I just love it. It, it is just <laughs> communing with the maker is mm -hmm. just i love it it's it's Fantastic. one of my favorite things to do wow well so as you're leaving as you're leaving high school where, where do you think life's taking you at that point what what were your absolutely okay. no idea probably because i was afraid to grow up on some okay. level like because i was too sheltered and so for me to separate from that shelter even at that age and it's kind of sad and pathetic maybe but is like, what am I going to do? Oh, I got to work for a living, don't I? I got to do that. Well, I worked <laughs> at my dad's school and dye shop, <clears throat> except my first summer of when I was 15, 16, I worked at a heavy equipment shop. But then my dad and another guy owned a tool and dye company that had a pretty good sized building with employees and stuff. So I worked there as a, mostly as a cleanup kid. I'm not running the big machines or whatever, but run a few little jobs for them. But I did that during the summers and I knew I did this, this is not for me. My brother ended up doing that kind of work just into Michigan to this day. He's still been the same company, probably gosh, about 40 years or something. Wow. But I, I knew I didn't want to do that. Yeah. Biology. Cause I don't know what else I would do. And so when I'm leaving high school, I did that because that's what you do unless you're going to go get a trade job. Yeah. And there wasn't anything that, that like, well, you know what? School sounds better, even though I'm not a big fan of school and not sure how I graduated, but I did. Somebody gave me a diploma, so I finished. <laughs> and, um, I, 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 yeah, I don't. And so what my whole idea was when it's like your senior year, like you got to, what am I going to do after you graduate? And it was this 
offense to Marker, by the way, the reason I went to Taylor was mostly because David said, hey, I'm going to Taylor if you want to go there. So we visited and ended up going there. So Dave's on my floor and some of these other buddies now that, that I got to meet and know. And uh, so I went there because what else am I going to do? And when I'm a senior in college, I'm like, we start, well, let me back up. When I'm in college and we had those m- meetings where faith is deepening, this new music thing showed up beyond only visiting this planet with Larry Norman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's like the Imperials. Mm-hmm. That all this, this, this Christian university, all these kids were listening to CCM stuff. A lot of kids, not all, but a lot of them were. Because it, where I went to school, you can't smoke, drink, or dance. Mm-hmm. It's like very conservative. It's not Bob Jones, but it's still conservative place, especially in like 1980 when I, my freshman year. So this one guy on our floor had this cassette from this band called Whiteheart. And, and I put it in and it was their first album, Whiteheart. And I was like, man, dude, this is like sweet because it's like, is this like, I've come to find later it's a bunch of studio dudes, you know, that were playing for the Bill Gaither trio when they're packing out 15,000 seat arenas at the time doing their Southern gospel. Once they were done at sound check and Bill and Gloria walked off the stage, these guys would start, there were guys wanting to do songwriting and, um, and studio gig stuff. And they were yeah. starting to do that. And so they'd get up there and play Toto play lover boy or any of that kind of pop rock stuff that they were listening to, but they were obviously influenced by their faith. And so they're trying to take music to a place beyond where even the Imperials went evolving, like the stuff they listened to, whether it was Zeppelin growing up and though there was hard to find any singers like that around. And that's why Toto, because Steve Green, the first lead singer for Whiteheart, Mm -hmm. if you ever, his voice, he would have been one of the best pop singers, rock guys anywhere. His voice is stupid awesome. It was the same like Sandy Patty. She was singing for the Bill Gaither trio, BGBs and stuff. A lot of the music industry in the early days of CCM came out of what Bill and Gloria did because they were huge, so they could find all all of the best players or singers that wanted to be out in front of people and work their craft and write in the background. They'd get on the tour bus afterwards, um, and they had to sell merch. That was part of their deal. It's like, you play in the band, then you sell our product after the shows, and then you can go do whatever you want. Oh, you're talking uh, about they're, they were selling Gaither stuff. They were like, the production, oh, I thought you were talking about the old, hey, you can come tour with us and whatever you can keep from, you can sell your merch and hopefully. You can oh, survive. no, 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 no. You're talking they about they put them to work. Because that was like in the late 70s that they were yes. doing that. And then okay. early 80s. And Whiteheart's first album, I think, came out in like 83, maybe? 283, 83. 83, uh, sweet, 83. Home, that was Home Sweet Home. With yeah. Chris Christian's oh, label, that's a, right? Geez. Yeah, that's a. I, well, that's a I whole other episode. That's some a whole of the, other... things are, the music industry, I don't care if it's CCM or mainstream or whatever. I don't know if you guys knew it or not, but in between Eden and when Jesus comes back, the world's broken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's broken. I so it's it. broken everywhere. Absolutely. And, and I am. I am. Just ask my wife. Knowing your story now, coming off the farm, kind of mm-hmm. Huckleberry Finn lifestyle. Yeah. Were you rocked? I'm jumping ahead just a tad, Scott. But were you rocked by that revelation that, that people are people and the music business is the music business? Did you have any kind of preconceived notions that, oh, man, Christian music is everybody's got it together and oh, everything's yeah. perfect and no one is going to double cross me or slit my throat when I'm not looking? Completely, I just was curious completely. to your naivete to Christian Yeah, music. I carried that naiveness for years, actually, in the band. But then when you realize you're hanging out with those guys that are a big part of the influence of the whole CCM industry, like a Dan Huff, and Billy was doing other projects. Gersh is a writer. Gordon Kennedy, hello. He's had a little success since Art. And actually, some of the most success 
the band members ever had was when they left the band. Because Dan, actually, speaking of Rascal Flatts, he produced a lot of the Rascal Flatts stuff, which actually sold an album or two. Mm-hmm. And it is, it's, it's amazing to think through, and Tommy, our bass player, that the only time Bruce Springsteen didn't use the E Street Band, Tommy Sims played bass. Gordon just finished the three, four-year stadium tour with Garth Brooks playing in front of millions and millions and millions of people around the world. And so I just feel like I could sing high and I was hyper on stage. That's why they kept me alive. (laughs) And because there wasn't, but I did a little writing here and there. I I never worked at it like they did. And if I'd have worked at it, it would have had some more, more things that would have gone on. Uh Oh, is that you? That is us. I'm pulling up a little footage. The, this is that the video. This is when you came into my life, personally. When you showed up, we did. When, when, you remember this? Oh, this was the. Oh yes. Yeah, oh, I, yeah. Those this are is the, the video effects. from "Don't Wait for the Movie." Yes, exactly. Those are the sound effects. Why is my coffee not working? There's no telling. Oh, Scott, there's me acting like an idiot. Yeah, uh, exactly. But, <laughs> I'm but good see, at that. Scott, these guys, just kind of playing off what he was talking about. These guys were. At the time, you didn't know it, but they were Christian royal, Christian music royalty because, like you sure. said, he, they were the foundations of what was happening. These guys in the studio were just mon- – I mean, the Huff brothers themselves, yeah, absolute monsters, monsters. Gordon Kennedy, he's he's just his family. <laughs> the, well, know, right the there, night. Chris McHugh on there. That, yeah. that was my roommate. Oh, dude. And he Chris played McHugh. over 10 years for Keith uh, – Keith, <laughs> Keith Urban. Keith yeah, Urban. Yeah. 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 And uh, who's actually a really – not because we hang or nothing, but Keith and Nicole really have been on and off involved in the community here. They really That's cool. uh, are well liked here in Nashville. That is area. so cool. That is so cool. So this is when you came into my life. I was into the the original White Heart album that you talked about that was on Home Sweet Home and Steve Green and just just unbelievable vocals. And then with Scott coming in during Hotline mm-hmm. and all that stuff, saw those tours. That was right yeah. in my wheelhouse. I was in college. We were totally into that. And then, then you came along. This album here, and then the three after that. See, I'm a huge Brown Bannister fan, and we can talk about that yeah. later, too. I just think his stuff, uh, unbelievable. His albums, if you just tell me as an album he produced, I am so in. But yeah. this is this is vintage Rick Florian coming out, and everybody was like, who in the world is this kid who is kinetic and energetic and spastic and just singing the paint off the walls and you just look like you were having so much fun tell me just a little bit about what this tour was like and then into emergency broadcast was it a was it a special golden time was it a blur was it oh my gosh this is way too much work what have i got myself into talk to me just a little bit about what this couple of years was like in your life that's so funny looking at that reminds me like i never forgot i used to be that young (laughs) the uh I, um, you know, so it's different when, if you develop a band or even as a solo artist, you start from point A, B, C, D down the road. Well, I came into the band after they already had established a modicum of success. And so it was, the first show I ever did was, February of 86, we played at Wheaton College in Chicago. They got a, it's actually where they have their worship services, but it's also, I think they have like 12, 1500 or something, the uh, auditorium holds. And I just remember, I thought I was going to spontaneously combust. I was so nervous because it, it's not, it's like when you, I'm performing on stage in front of this many people and the hardest part is I'm kind of the guy. Mm-hmm. When yeah. I was in oh, choirs, no. I was not the guy. It was one mon- it was kind of like this one entity. So now they're all looking at me. And not that there weren't other guys on stage, but I'm I am a focal point and sure. it, it is a that just scared the, the Easy's out of me. I was just, oh my gosh, I was so, oh, I was so scared. I just, in that first, 
took about one and a half to two songs to realize I got to slow down, fella, because I was so scared. I just was running everywhere. I'm running and ah, because I was so, so, I thought maybe I think if I run fast enough, they won't see me. Um, <laughs> and well, um, because, Rick, let, go ahead. I, let, yeah, well, I, I was going to say, I, I'm curious because I think this is an important point. Most artists kind of climb a ladder, if you will, right? Yeah. You're, you're going step by step by step. Your career was like one step, two step. And then you're at the top of the ladder almost. I mean, that yeah. you really did take a, a, a ginormous jump. Yeah. Tell me, what, what is it? Because you had to have certain characteristics in your life that allowed that to happen. Okay, that doesn't, you may have been presented with the opportunity, but you weren't, but a lot of artists might not have ever been able to make that transition. What do you think that you were able to bring to the table to allow that transition to take place? I think it was a combination of factors. Um, uh, one of the guys in the band had said, I, I used to do every once in a while this thing because I'm spastic, that I was on the road crew for Whiteheart before I sang for them. That was yes. another atypical thing. <clears throat> so when they had to, when they decided after Scott Douglas had to leave, that's a story in and of itself. But when, if they were going to continue, they took about a month, they go, you know what, we feel like we need to continue Honestly, Mark said it best, where it's like, felt like he could be giving Satan a victory if we quit. Not okay. that we knew what was ahead, that what God might have ahead. It was just like, we need to keep going and see what happens. And so they held auditions. Well, they knew that I had thoughts about singing. I actually tried out for Russ Taft's background vocal, like trio he had on. I don't remember if that was Walls of Glass. I can't remember what tour it was. <clears throat> but I didn't get that because I was just, I didn't know nothing about anything other than singing in a choir. But one benefit is I did understand a little like SATB reading music some. Mm -hmm. I had some of that. So that did help a little. But they, I was on the tour bus with them every day. So they knew me as a person. And at least they knew me more than they would somebody who would try out who came from Topeka. Mm -hmm. they, they just got a referral from, hey, there's a guy in Topeka you need to have fly in for rehearse or for uh, tryouts. So I tried out with a couple groups of guys. One time it was in like around December and then a couple weeks later with a, another group of guys and a couple weeks later with a third group of guys. And when that's happened, I'm like, do these guys actually think I could do this thing? Or are they just so codependent they just stringing me out because they didn't want to come out. <laughs> and, and so um, they asked me to try out on a weekend of shows. Wheaton was the first one. And so kind of the rest is history. I, I did bring something like, if you've ever seen Steve Green, I didn't bring a Steve Green vocal, but I brought a physical nature that was something that they loved. I think it was coming. Yeah, you can sing high. And, but he's bringing a stage thing that we've never had before. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big, one of the biggest parts, but then they knew me some from being on the road. So okay. I think a combination of personal relationship, sing high enough. And, but there was a stage thing that, that they wanted to see if they could make that work. Okay. I, I would agree as a kind of a, again, we all rode this, this, this train and we all saw the evolution of Christian music from a different perspective. So as you're sharing these stories and the memories are coming back to me and how I was different bands hit you differently and different bands were iconic with a certain voice and a certain front man and all that stuff. And so I'm just listening to what you're saying and it's making me think about all those times. And so Whiteheart hit me as a band, as an ensemble. And even though those guys were very front and center, where I'm going with this question is I wanted to know, I'm always fascinated by, these bands that have longevity and they interchange lead front men. We talked about this with John Schlitt. I'm wondering when you watch behind the music and you, you know, hear about Arnold Pineda and Journey and you're, you're seeing a foreigner is going to continue on without iconic voices. What's going through your mind to even think about that? And then knowing your background and you just kind of take life as it comes at you, are you just, I, I just do it. I just get up there and I do it. But do you think about it? I wonder what's going through your mind as you see these other guys that go try to follow somebody else. 
and be yourself. And yet, oh my gosh, I'm up here with all these guys and now I'm the front guy. And so I'm thinking Arnold Pineda, he's in the Philippines and all of a sudden he's now front and center in front of Neil Sean and these guys yeah. journey and he's got to be going, okay, is this my band now? Or what, how do I do this? And how do I, how do I carry that legacy with respect? And I guess it's a lot of the guys themselves. It's, it's who you are, but it's also how they treat you. Yeah. I think that taking life as it comes was probably the phrase out of what you said that kind of might fit the most where and, and back to that phrase that Gersh always used curiously dreamless it wasn't like i didn't dream of doing that once i put my penny in the kitty for the columbia house getting 13 albums for a penny and i started listening to boston and fleetwood mac that rumors album is just insane and mm -hmm. so i was kind of a pop rock guy that's like what i listened to and when i heard whiteheart that was part of that genre that I was gravitating to musically. And so I think when that, it, I mean, it was a fit because of musically and frankly, I don't know how much I actually earned getting in the band because those guys, when you guys who've started from nothing and build something, my goodness, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. I came in, when it already was developed on some level. And so I'm thankful that, so thankful that I got to do it. And this, as they say, the rest is history. And but I got to think guys like Gershmel and Smiley, I think it takes a special person to build something and curate it well and understand the roles of it. To me, I'm a sports guy. So I'm looking at bringing in a franchise quarterback or a larger than life coach. And it's understanding how the pieces fit together. So guys like Gershmel and, and Smiley have got to know, okay, do they sit you down and go, okay, let's play to your strengths and let's, let's write music that's going to feature a guy mm -hmm. like Rick. And did, did, were you brought into that process? I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, they, about were, the they were as welcoming as I wanted to be when it came to the writing thing. They also knew I had no experience in it. And so when we go over to Gersh's apartment and, and there would be anywhere from just, maybe he and Billy or he and Gordon or uh, five guys over there. Sometimes it'd be one guy 15 feet away with another dude working on some hook they had in a melody line while somebody else, two or three other guys were over talking through some lyrical twists and, and things to do. Cause as you get in some in quotes, writing session time, whether well, it's often just two guys, but can be more when you're involved in a band. It is, as many writers have said through the years, sometimes you have a song that writes itself and it happens in it one, two hours. That is not normal, but it happens. Mm -hmm. And some songs happen over a year or two. Like there's a part of it, but you just kind of leave it. You set it on the shelf, like that might be a thing but then you're moving on to other things and that you go that one idea we had on blah, blah, that you pull that off the shelf and kind of look at it and work it, that there was another time that it was maybe supposed to happen and life experiences you're writing. That's why some of the songs that came from, well, like 70 times seven came through some life experience that the band had and that flag of fly was the same way. Montana sky. There, there's some of those things that came from hurt. It, the, the writing process is cathartic a lot of times. And that's when it's frankly the best times. Cause one of the, the things you don't want to do in my not so humble opinion is write to make money. Mm. Now you have to make money or you can't do music. Right. And that was always a, the challenge of ministry and music. That's one of the things that mainstream music doesn't have to worry about. And, uh, but, you know, the, the connection of making a living doing music is you, you just can't do it for that because you, you formulaically do stuff and that's mm -hmm. gross. And, and you feel it when you're doing it. So, and you might have record label pressure to say like, Dude, we need another 70 times seven. We need another blah, blah. And we get that part of it. And you understand that. 
But whenever you can write as much as you can from some core story that's happening in life, there will be a connection on the other side when it hits the LP, if you will, or the airwaves mm -hmm. that somebody intersects with it. When you write from hurt or fear or something, by the time it gets out there and people hear it, they, they connect to it because there was an authenticity in that story you're telling from hurt, fear, whatever, and, mm -hmm. or joy or whatever. It's all these different things that when people can connect with it, it matters. And that's, I think, art on any level, that God made it so that it's this attractive thing. And Gersh also used to say, like, it's it's a tool, but it's like a knife. You can stab somebody or butter, butter your toast. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. Wow. When you look back on kind of the White Heart years, were they broken up in sections? Or was it one big blur and it just was amazing? Because powerhouse and tales of wonder and all that stuff that happened later although that may be someone else's sweet spot for white heart that wasn't mine we started having kids and we got into barney and that's a whole nother thing but <laughs> i'm just wondering from your perspective when you look back on the white heart years what was your favorite part of it i don't know from a year's standpoint i will say while white heart as anybody who knows them moderately or more we had a lot of players that came and went from that band. And a lot of the reason was there were studio level players. There were songwriters, they were producers. And so people wanted them to play on their album. And, and that even evolved into mainstream music. People wanted them to play on their album. And uh, Tommy had said, and I didn't even know that, that, he was at the, I think it was the Grammys, and he got hired by Twyla Paris to play bass for him, and that's when Springsteen heard him. And so where on God's green earth would there ever have been a time that you would have said, Springsteen yeah. is hearing Twyla Paris? <laughs> <laughs> that was the, obviously, that was on the non-televised segment of uh, the Grammys. But... Right. Um, it, it is the Freedom album was probably the most, um, I don't know, you don't want to call it a pinnacle, I guess, but the, the freedom, time. Freedom, the is, freedom stands alone. I, I would say if you're on a deserted island and you can only get 10 <laughs> CCM albums, Freedom would have to be one of them, quite frankly. Again, Brown Bannister, right? Oh. He, a wonderful human being, and, and it was a perfect, he is a, he will work you like, a, what's the, some kind of mule, I forget the phrase. He, he will work you, but nobody is kinder in just beating the crud out of you than Brown Bannister. He, you only knew it because it was wearing you out, but otherwise he would just seem like this sweet, young fella there encouraging you in your work. And at the end of the day, we were like, man, he beat the heck out of me. Gee, man, he, yeah. golly, I'm just dead. Everybody, so, everybody we talked to says the same thing. He absolutely got the best out of us. Yeah. He's the kind of person at the end of the day, you were like, thank you, sir. May I have another? Because you were just yeah, worn out. Exactly. He, he was so, he's a thoughtful man. He, when you can get a producer that not only understands music, but understands like songs, mm. uh, both lyrically and musically, that like that is not just getting the nitty gritty of the guitar sound and or drum, bass sound, whatever, the layering and all the different things that you get that go down on, in quotes, tape that we don't have anymore, mm. that putting that stuff down, but you got to know what's a good song. Somebody might write a song, they think it's great, but no, nah, it's fine that it's not anything special and he was really good at song selection too and you had a guy that was he didn't have any songwriter credit kind of thing to be able to say we're picking this song over this song when you got all these songwriters in this band and we said you're the guy in charge because we trust you and so we're gonna leave we have input obviously but final decisions kind of like when, when we're not on the same page, 
then we're going to have to defer to Brown because that's why he's here. That's what he's getting paid for. So we have to trust that he has that album's full best showing up. That's why he's there in that seat. And so the guys did that. They might fight at times for certain things like, man, I, we just need, can we tweak somehow this section of the turnaround to make something more happen? And like some of the funnest times I ever had recording like that, I think when you were playing that little video segment, the front of the song uh, Power Tools, where yes. it has all these sound effects. Yes. Things, yes. Those yes. were ones that we created at the Bennett House on Fourth Avenue, just north of Main Street in Franklin, Tennessee, my favorite place to record. I would say half the stuff we ever did was recorded there. And rolling a aerosol can slowly across the hardwood floor that's irregular. So you hear the. Blanca, 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 Blanca. Mm -hmm. And one spot where I'm holding a microphone at the end of a long hallway and three rooms away, Gordon starts yelling. And so you can barely hear it, but he's running at full speed around the house and coming right up to my microphone that I'm standing there holding. And here's Gordon, you know. You know, but he does that over a five, 10 second period. Run, 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 run. And he's yelling the whole time with one breath. Who doesn't have fun? That's fun. Isn't that fun? <laughs> so being screwballs, just we were acting up, but we had a purpose behind it. And there's a squeaky door. That was one of the old doors in the house. So and it reminded me if you ever saw the Bohemian Rhapsody movie. That's exactly were, what I was thinking that's about, that's, Rick. It that's reminded me yeah. of like, oh my gosh, that's what we were doing. I just thought it's like we're not queen, but you know, still it it was like hilarious and doing layered vocals where you end up having sixteen tracks of BGVs on a thing. So to thicken that thing up and make it almost sound like an instrument making sound. And so that part of me was like, I have all these high level dudes and I'm just farm boy from Indiana. It was like, I was like in a candy store figuring out how they're doing stuff and flipping a, a two inch tape over so you can do a reverse drum snare and then recording that. And it's like, what, what are you doing? What is Simpty time code? What is, I don't even, <laughs> they told me what it was. And after they were done telling me, I didn't know what Simpty time code was. Totally, it was totally like, never. what in the world? There are like these, a bunch of evil scientists in there doing like creating all this right. stuff that it was like so exciting and it's at times monotonous when over and over and over they're trying to figure out what's the best tweak on this bass lick, just sound wise, sonically, how mm -hmm. much reverb, how much delay and compression and all these things that I had no idea that I heard them all the time listening to albums but I didn't know what made those things happen. So it was fun in the science of watching some of these things occur and the difference between analog and digital and what that is and what it sounds like when you hear the difference between a digital sound and an analog sound. And now them creating analog sounds that are digital, but they make them sound analog. and. And some of that I can't even tell the difference. Well, and it was a weird, again, back to the timing. There was so much happening right before our eyes because we went from literally 8-track to cassette to digital mm -hmm. CDs, digital. Mm -hmm. And then we also lived through you know, Napster and where we are now. But, I mean, yeah. just so much happened. We talk a lot. So much happened in Christian music. So much happened in the church. So much happened in technology. So much happened in media. And we... It's, it's the out-of-the-box thinkers. It's the Steve Jobs of, of, of that genre that sat in a studio and went, well, this is how we used to do it, but what if we did it this way? And what's a DAT machine, and how, what can I do with it? And yep. just really thinking out of the box, and yet the dynamic of the record companies and the AR guys going, oh, we got to have another 70 times 7, and you got to make it so formulaic. And you're like, somebody yeah. go lock the door for a minute. <laughs> we, will, <laughs> we, we, will get back to, we will get back to you in a week. Just leave us alone. That, that you know? kind of did happen and i will say the anr guys through the years were lovely that i had at different labels that you know peter york what a sweetheart of a human being i love him still to this day saw him about nine months ago hmm. it, it, it's there 
they got to do their thing. That's what they're hired to do. And so they got to keep giving this input, trying to steer where they can, but knowing they have these people that have their own opinions who are creating the art and how's that going to come down? All right. Scott knows at this point, this is where he looks at me and goes, look, dude, we're going to go four more hours. If you keep <laughs> all our music, I get one last question. I get one last question. I get one last question that I'll hand in the baton. What is your eight? Your at to this day, your absolute favorite white heart song to sing and why? Wait, song to sing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't want to sing any of them now. No, 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 no. Okay. If we were able to put you back into kinetic, kinetic boy's body and you could rip it at your very best when you're at your height, what song was the most fun to sing in concert and why? Man, that is excellent. I don't know if anybody's ever asked it quite that way. And that's really kind of cool that I'm thinking, okay, when I was at my vocal peak, wow. The, was there a concert that stood out? Was there a moment? Was there a moment nature. where you're like, man, I closed my eyes and I remember that night in wherever, and it was just. It might magic. have been. It was magic. Well, I'll tell you, there was a, a festival I may or may not still have. I don't know. Called, oh, wait, what is the festival out in Nowheresville, Pennsylvania? But it was the biggest one. Creation. Uh, creation. Creation. So. Uh, in a professional sense, you always wanted to play Friday night or Saturday night because that's when the most people were going to be there. Right. And so it, it's farmland, Nowheresville, and you are playing in front of 80,000 people. So the hyper boy here, that is like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. And I've been doing it for years now. And so I'm not afraid anymore. I'm excited. And so because the first three, six months in the band, I was still trying to get over the fear of messing up, not knowing what to do, and just enjoying the time with the people. And that became my favorite part of being in the band was being with those people out there that we were connecting and just like throwing myself every once in a while, literally, but off the stage to commune with them, to be with them. That was like my favorite thing. So when you got 80,000 of those, that's crazy. And and I don't know why, I don't know if I do have a for sure one, but like Kingdom Come is this interesting dynamic song where Gersh starts out and the happenstance riff that Tommy brought up on that. And his, the way he did this slap of hitting it, the way that it hit a fret, the string and, the that I, I just grew the world out of that. Oh, it was awesome. And so dynamically, it gets crazy towards the end, almost like when we did Little Drummer Boy. That's one of my favorite recordings we ever yes. did. Yes. <clears throat> where it went from this to like the stratosphere. And so some so it would be the songs of dynamics, but also ones that made me dance where oh, what's the one from the freedom album like invitation was one of my funnest dance ones that was a fast gun tommy and gordon got together and that thing played itself out that song came together so fast like that was one of those couple hours songs mm -hmm. that just went quick for them and so things that would make me dance things that dynamically went low to high the building of that, it, the physical nature of growing with it, with the crowd and those kind of things, those would have been the kind of songs. And you can sit back in an intimate thing and do a Desert Rose and stuff like that too, where it's just, there is not really energy, but it is, there's an intimacy of that as well. So it, it's hard to know for sure, but... Um, I'm thinking about how you explain to us what I would call your connection to music. And it's so much more inner and, and very visceral as opposed to, oh, the lyrics here and they just really got me. And any time I got to that, I had a hard time not crying. Yeah. Uh, it's funny you say that because I can relate to that too. I mean, the older we get and I'm like, now what you're, you're the third kid and what's your name? And whereas if someone rolls an eighties tune, I've got every lyric, no problem. I can get every one of them. 
And then my wife will go, what did you just sing? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just an old Rick Springfield tune. She goes, did you hear what you just said? I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. because, yep. because I, I'm in 1982. Like me. Yeah. I, am, I am in 1982 right now and I'm yeah. feeling the vibe. I have no idea what I just said in front of my grandchildren. Yes. <laughs> yes. My wife has said that literal phrase to me. Like, and Gordon said that phrase to me. Uh, I remember my first festival we played, uh, February 86, first show. It was like late spring or something. Actually, it was in Sandwich, Illinois. There was some small festival that we played at, and I am not a professional singer, even though technically I'm getting paid for it at that point, <clears throat> where I didn't, it was, it was sad how, how little I realized lyrics meant <laughs> when I started out. So we did, oh, what's the, on, it might be on the first White Heart album. Look out, here the starting gun is the phrase in one of the songs. And and I sang, just like on those commercials, the shampoo guy singing in the shower and singing the wrong lyrics to songs, I sang wrong lyrics to Whiteheart song because I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really seem to care about what it was going to be. And so it's like, time to run, got to run, instead of like, uh, look out, he's got a gun, is what I sang. And I sang that song and then... There's a time maybe where Mark or one of the guys were going to talk for 30 seconds for the next song. And I come off stage and Gordon's off that side of stage. And he goes, what did you sing on that last song? And I'm like, what? Because I'm just like dumb three-year-old. Like, what? I'm just having fun, right? What? And he's like, said, on the lyric, blah, 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 blah. And I go, oh, what did you say? Uh, I sang, da, 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 time to run. Look out, he's got a gun. And like, what's up? What? <laughs> and he's he got a problem goes, with that <laughs> no no that's that's not the lyric and and so that was literally one of the first times i started to realize like oh wait yeah words do matter don't they so i should probably sing in front of these thousands of people the right lyrics that would be good because if nothing else the art director the person who wrote it cares they sure, put that word in their yeah, career yeah. <laughs> Rick, let, let me ask this. What You're 61 years old. And one of the things that uh, Chris and I talk about is as we get toward, let's say, the fourth quarter of our life, when we're, when yeah. we're let's be honest, we, we, we know there's a clock ticking somewhere. Um, sure. it's, it's always a good idea to kind of look back and see what what were the defining things? How did our life change? Things like that. I'm just curious, as you look back on your life at 61, what would you say might be the one or two or even three defining moments? And how did your life change direction as a result of those things? What, what is it you look back on and you go, nah, my life's different because of a decision I made or because of something that happened at that point in my life? Well, my wife, Lisa, and I getting married was a pinnacle moment for me. And, and we just had our 26th anniversary. And... Because it's other than the relationship we have with the one who made us, yes, that's like the most important one, really. And I'm not still not good at it. I, I'm still working. I'm still mm -hmm. working. And because some of the ways I was raised, I was a real immature guy for a long time, and I have a hard time even saying the phrase "I'm mature now." Okay. It, 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 <laughs> but, but. A lot of work and trying to figure stuff out, and I don't really have that complex of a brain, and I don't think through things very, in a way that's very complex often. Another moment is deciding not to do music anymore. That, that seems was, to be a really big, uh, you, you've talked about that, and I know some other interviews. I, I'm, I'm curious about that because that's a that's a big change from where you were to where you are today. What what was the catalyst for that? I always say there were 18 reasons I quit, <laughs> and I do kind of call it quit. Um, you know, and I don't know what they are. I just know there were 18 of them. There was a time where my previous wife wanted to leave, and so that was a negative pinnacle on the amplitude scale. Sure. And 
but music was changing. Grunge was becoming big it, with Nirvana and the, and the like, and it just felt it felt like it had run its course on some level. And going back to when I got a biology degree because I didn't know what else I wanted to do, mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, what am I going to do if I don't do music anymore? And really, in a similar kind of fashion, I always loved real estate. I always it was interesting to see developments happen. Mm-hmm. And just intrigued by that and the process of buying a house. And like, I'm in my fourth one now that my wife and I both hope is we want to be buried. My wife says, I want to be buried in the backyard. Well, yeah, this is like, I'm good. Yeah. And, and so I guess the, that part of what am I going to do if I don't do music? I considered and kind of walked a little bit out of like, would I do a solo thing or whatever? And, I talked to Wayne Kirkpatrick a little bit about it and a couple other guys. And, and it's like, it just felt forced. It Mm -hmm. just felt forced. And while, and I told Mark and Billy, it's like, you know what? I think I'm, I'm done. And we were on curb records at the time. And my great guy, Mike curb had great relationship with, he was very patient with us. And I I feel like I started doing real estate. I got licensed while we still existed as a band just to kind of start feeling that out Mm -hmm. and, and kind of walking out a few of the pathways of like, where do I need to be? What, you know, and in a lot of ways, I always feel like God just put us here for relationship with him. And some of that other stuff doesn't have to be like, Paul on the road to Damascus kind of stuff. It, it's just going to be like, walk it out, just kind of walk it out. And I started doing the real estate thing and, and I really enjoyed it. I was nervous because for many people, it's the most, the largest investment they'll ever make in their life. So the responsibility of that, mm-hmm. it took me a while, just like in Whiteheart to feel comfortable with, I can really take care of these people. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, And I love it. I'm so thankful I got to do a music thing that I loved. And now I do something else completely different that I love. There's a creative part to home buying and selling. But and it's one of the reasons I think I like the raw land thing. I like what that thing could become. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if it's only to hunt Bambi. Yeah. Or and sometimes it's much more than that. Do you think it was easier to let go of music because you had another passion that popped up that kind of took over some of that creativity and some of that drive? Uh, Scott, I want to follow up with that because I would almost I was going to wonder if I said it's not that you necessarily left music, but in a way music left you. And did that make it easier because it just didn't hold the yeah. appeal or even look like or like I just didn't feel like I fit it. It, it left me. And you so here feel I am. Like kind of well, both of you there. The I feel like I don't when I'm in my car, I have done for several years now, probably till the day I die now, will the Bible reading through the Bible in a year. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I will have it read to me on a U version one. And but other than after I'm done doing that, if that's where I am or at home. Then I will t- put on sports talk. Mm-hmm. I don't listen to music hardly ever unless somebody's in the car who wants to listen to music. Um, I will every once in a while, but literally 99 times out of 100, mm-hmm. I will listen to sports talk or mm-hmm. NPR, just some news, kind mm-hmm. of what's going on in the world. And uh, so music's really, I would say, I it kind of left me after I like picked at it a little, do I need to? It's like now, but I also have to provide a living on some level. Sure. So, and that takes a while to develop some of that. So I was, had some concerns about that part of it. Cause what am I going to do with biology degree 25 years later? Yes. You know, or 15 at the time, maybe. And I would have had to been a teacher for a while. Well, that's not, and sadly how much teachers get paid that with was not going to cover it. Yeah. So part of it was a pragmatic element too, 
that once I found that I could make a good living doing that and I enjoyed it, I feel like a spoiled brat. I got to do the music thing. Now I get to do something else that provides that I love to do. And yeah. I'm so thankful. I'm really thankful. Scott, let's transition a little bit with what time we have left and talk about the future. I know that's really big for Scott. Yeah. Scott's got another podcast that, that we do together to families of autism, and he's mm. a, a hero of mine for many reasons. But I think one of the things God's using Scott in my life for is to continue to sharpen me as it relates to dealing with the crap that comes with life. Mm. And uh, one of the things we like to talk about is <laughs> it's funny even though you kind of came from the small farm in Indiana and then you're just like this rock star all of a sudden, the, the road is tough and you're not making big bucks like it may feel like you are. And, and then you've got relationships that die and you're like, okay, wait a minute. I'm, that doesn't happen to me. I'm the all American yeah. boy and I, and I sing and I dance and I'm, everybody likes me. Why would someone want to leave me? And so just dealing with the crap that comes in a broken world, Scott's been really good about that. He does a great job on this other podcast. And when, when God gives you a, an autistic child and he's 21, 23 now. He's 21 like that, now. Yeah. I just, he's a hero of mine. And so I, I really glean a lot from him. And so I, I want to kind of let Scott take this and run a little bit with what's left of our show to talk about what is it we're going we're gonna to leave behind? What does this look yeah. like for the next generation? When it's all said and done, we, we like to say sometimes that there's going to be a day when we're gone, when our kids are sitting around the table, they're having dinner and the, the conversations, boy, we, we really miss dad. I wish he was here. Could you please pass the salt? Yeah. In that situation, what are you hoping that your children or grandchildren see in you? How is it that you hope that you define your legacy for your family? My, my belief tells me that in there's nothing that matters more than our faith in the one who made us so that after this life we worship God forever mm -hmm. and for them to know that and as I see I have five kids and 14 20 28 almost 29 31 and 32 too? Well, it's it's their stories and their lives, but there are, I, that's so funny that you said that, because even when I think of my dad who's still living, both my wife and I have lost our moms about mm -hmm. four or five years ago, and my father-in-law who's walked in at one point, he lives with us in a little house we built next to our house, mm -hmm. and when I think of my dad who's still living, he just got diagnosed with he wouldn't care me saying this multiple myeloma, which is what my mother-in-law died from, which is why we moved, built a little house so they could live here. So from a care standpoint, mm -hmm. and it is that it's just a part of what life is that mm -hmm. on some level we might fade into the ether a bit. Mm -hmm. They'll tell old stories while they're passing the salt mm -hmm. um, periodically, not every day. It, it's mm -hmm. just because they have their own lives and they have their kids that are taking up all the bandwidth to do life. And right. so that's okay. That's what life is. I, I don't know from a legacy standpoint what I know there are things that they'll say about me. And some of, on some level, I think that I think some of our strengths always have an underbelly and a weakness side to them at a different angle. Mm -hmm. And so, and where I was not raised to lead a family, my mom did that. My dad okay. worked hard, but mm -hmm. so it is taking, and I'm still figuring and walking that out, what leading a family looks like. Mm -hmm. And, okay. and so you know, I'm still, I, till the day I die, I, w I know I will feel I'm not good at it, but God's in it. And as long as I keep reading those pieces of the word that tell me and show me where that shows up, that like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's a thing. So reminding myself, I get anxiety when I think of my most important relationships, when they're, when you have a, a low point that you're mm -hmm. like, it gives me a lot of anxiety. And 
because I'm ill-equipped environmentally growing up. It was vacuous. It was very, there was almost nothing for the male member of the house to do that. Again, he provided well, my dad, for our family, but I didn't get equipped with showing what that looks like. So I've had to learn it from other, watching others, buddies mm-hmm. that I meet with once a week and seeing how they walk that stuff out with their families. And so that's still a work in progress. Wow. So they know I love having fun with my family and just being together and just being in the presence of one another is mm-hmm. what I, it doesn't have to be anything special, just being with one another. And what was that Chapin song back in the seventies where it's like, almost like not cats in the cradle to that degree, but the, I have to reach out with one of my boys that used to live here. He's moved the ones with the grandkids because he is working it. He's got work that's overtime. He's got four little kids. Mm -hmm. He has his wife. And Mm -hmm. so all those things take up a ton of time. So where when he was down here, we had more time, but now he's back up in Illinois, Northern Illinois. And so I don't get to talk to him as much as I would like to. Mm -hmm. And, but one of my other ones might make a move. And so it's all those different things where I love when I talk with my kids. I love it. I love like last night where my wife and I are just sitting watching a show on TV, just being with her. I love it because those are the things that we're like made for. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and I don't say that because, and I do a great job at it. I do. it's (laughs) it's, It's, it's like, but I love it. And sometimes it's really hard and sometimes it's just beautiful just because this side of heaven and, and this side of Eden, that spot in between mm-hmm. is, is where, is where we live and it's broken. Dude, yeah. It is a mess. And so it takes work to push in the brokenness away and try to bring in the reality of where God walks with us in those things. And it's daily. That's yeah. why I, the more that I have the word every day, doesn't mean that I got it together. It's right. like, it just means I'm less worse. <laughs> <laughs> That's, no. my what? What? That's my what? phrase. That's my phrase. Less worse. Less worse. <laughs> yeah. hey, uh, Scott, let me encourage Rick with, with one thing before we shift. I, the older I get, the more value I put on being present. And so if what they say of you is, you know what? When we think about Uncle Rick and Papa Rick and all that, he was here. And when he was here, he was here. Uh, a yeah. lot of times I'm here, but I'm not here. I'm somewhere yeah. else and I'm thinking down that part of that's just the ADD brain that we have. Part of it's as a creative, you're always thinking about the next thing. So I have to really work at being here. So part of my legacy is to try to work on being present and the that's- value that that is so that you don't get hung up in all the, Oh, he's this great singer and he was this great, he built this great empire and he did this and he did all these incredible things. I just want to encourage you that being here is one of the greatest things you can ever do. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's true. And I can't remember somebody, something I read a, a day or two ago about, if we look back, you can look back at stuff. You can look forward at the future, but really in the moment, I think it was the CS Lewis thing. It was like, this is where God has me right now. So what do I do with what God has me for right now? And like, I'm sad my grandkids moved up to Northern Illinois because my son's a loser. (laughs) (laughs) He, because that walking in the woods that I love, walking in the woods with grandkids and saying, see this fun guy here? Look at the shelf fun guy on this dead wood. It's feeding on that cellulose material. Or, well, I wouldn't say cellulose because they're like, what? Um, (laughs) It's it's looking at and picking up a leaf. See the shape of this leaf? That's a maple leaf. And look at this one. That's an oak leaf. Quercus is the genus. And just little, and what's genus? You know, again, I'm, it, but it's like, those are the kind of things that look, enjoy the things that God gave us, his creation around us. Enjoy each other. Work to not be idiots with each other. And living in the moment is, yeah. is and figuring out, for me, the hardest part is, how to live or be in the moment when it's not good, when it's hard. How do I process 
when the emotions are like really not cool. Because anybody can, when it's great, it's like be in the moment, loving it. Yeah. And, but yeah, I'm still working on that, the broken side of me until Jesus La- comes back. La- last piece would be. Is there anything that you still have to finish? Is there something that uh, between now and whenever you're called home that you'd like to see yourself accomplish? Or is there so- something that you want to try to, to to do between now and the end? Look forward to concrete my driveway. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my asphalt breaking uh, up. Scott, so, Scott now you're Scott. sounding like a grumpy old man. I'm loving yeah. it. Well, it's, it's <laughs> I'm going to get my box of rocks and come to your house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, I, I don't, I want to pay my bills. I want to love my wife well, and I'm still not there. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Like, cause I don't, I don't need to, I, I, I really, I just, I want to engage in fellowship with guys at my church and, and just in friendship too. Yes. The, no, I, I don't think so. I think all I want to do is like those things that matter the most, try to find those places that God can teach me enough that I can do better at loving well. And yeah. that's really the part that, you know, and frankly, it's the most work for me yeah. wise. Like I gravitate and I don't blame God for uh, the hurts in the world because Mm -hmm. I do go back to that axiom of like between heaven and Eden, like it's broke. That's why Jesus came back. Yep. And now my wife was saying this morning, it's like, we can sure come back now. That would be just fine with me. And Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. And then I also then will sit back and go, you know what? God didn't send his son to get me out of the mess. Right. On some level, maybe, but from my heart's perspective, worshiping God forever mm-hmm. is what Jesus died for yes. so that I could have a way to be there with him. And so as opposed to, and I do have these days frequently where it's like, God, get me out of here. This place is a mess. We're having an, another election year every four years. Please father, make it be after the election. Like <laughs> let this year fly by because all everybody's going to do is tell everybody how evil the other person is. Yeah. They're not going to talk about the points and elements that matter. They're just going to pee on each other. It's just yep. like, you're horrible. You suck. You get out. You know, no, no. It's like, oh, Father in heaven. If there's any element of how showing that the world is broken, it's politics in our country. It's yeah. just Amen. It's grotesque. Amen. And on the flip side, we get a great opportunity to be different. And be mm-hmm. a breath of, breath of fresh air. Yes, and when I have to share, somebody brings stuff up about the election, mm-hmm. and I'm like, like, they're all imperfect, just like we are, but some mm-hmm. ways it makes me feel better about myself. <laughs> I'm you what, man. I don't want to vote for, I don't want to vote for any of them. Yeah. But they're all it's manipulative, that whole world and the power seeking and wanting to look out for themselves before they look out for constituents. Yeah. is what it feels like to me. So it's well, like, oh, I got to do my duty, but I'm just like, I'll, I'll be frank, last election cycle of the big one, like mm-hmm. when we had the election last season, I voted for Tim Creek. You don't know Tim Creek probably. No. He's a buddy of mine from church who fixes guitar equipment, and he just lives a half mile down the road from me. Because I would way rather have Tim Creek than anybody else. It would be hilarious if he was president. And I doubt (laughs) anyone else wrote in Tim Creek for president. But that's it it defined like I can't vote for any of these people. They're all insane. And so is what it is. Hopefully in a season where everybody's sowing seeds of fear, as Christians, we can continue to sow seeds of hope. We're and exactly and hope. we've got we we can't we can't we can't contribute to the seeds of fear. We, we can't participate in that. We've got yeah. to be the seeds of hope. You oh, said so. hope is spoken well because that's that's what it's built on nothing less. And yeah. so keep aiming there. Yeah, we got to talk about some of that stuff we do, yeah. but it, it is 
and those that are disenfranchised from the church because you know what the church is filled with people like you guys and me yep and so those people that want to not engage with people at church on sunday god has called us to do that to work out our relationships and it might not be fun but how the, how many in the church have walked away from the church they would say they still have a relationship with jesus <clears throat> but they're not going to fellowship with those people yeah. we we have to god's called yes. us to that yes biblically and otherwise <clears throat> and and that's why i don't church jump i've been at the same church since we started it back in 85 i think and uh, not because it's perfect right. but because no. that's like what i'm going to find the perfect church down the road no. or worse maybe is these this pastor speaks to me and that music works for me so is it a consumer perspective that I'm taking into that body? What's in it for me? Right. What do I got that it, it it's that's gross to me? Yeah. It, it's and it it's nothing to be like like anyway. I wow. from this experience we just had for the last whatever time that I'll just keep going on that for. <laughs> well, again, I'll be well, talking about Bambi shooting in the forest or something. I don't know. Rick, you you've got to promise us that you'll you'll visit with us again so that we can cover some of these more important topics if you don't mind well, we'd I'm, love to love I'm, to do it again unfortunately happy to do that okay. <laughs> <laughs> well it's been a pleasure rick thank you so much and for for a guy that's not passionate of music today you and i still have a love of a lot of the great songs that came out of the 80s so we, we can still listen to those all all day long so mm -hmm. again thank you so much for joining us and thank you for being a, a fresh breath of air thank you You're very much very welcome thankful to do it we wish you the very, very best. Godspeed and continue to be used by him and just be authentic and real. You're amazing, buddy. Yeah. Thank you. For sure. We will be in touch. Let's do it again soon. Okay. Thanks, God. Thanks.